great honor to be given the opportunity to introduce our scholarly guests. These intellectual in individuals will be given seven to eight minutes to describe themselves to you. After all the panel members have described themselves, you will have the opportunity to ask them questions as well as asking Dr. Ted Hensley Williams questions. At this time, I would like to take some time and introduce the panel who sits before you. Dan Erlacher, English instructor at North Idaho College, will portray Adam Smith, who was known for being a moral philosopher and public economist. Mr. Smith will not be with us for the entire program due to a previous engagement, so let's enjoy the time while he's here. Nina Bartlett, economic instructor at North Idaho College, will portray Alice Rivlin, who took office June 24th, 1996, as vice chair of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. Carol Hott, Center of New Direction Coordinator at North Idaho College, will portray Betty Frieden. But Betty was a founder and first president of the National Organization for Women. In 1975, Betty was named the Humanist of the Year. Kay Nelson, computer and business instructor at North Idaho College, will portray Bill Gates. Mr. Gates is the chairman and chief executive officer of Microsoft Corporation and leading provider worldwide of software for the, per, for the personal computer. Joanne Nelson, business instructor at North Idaho College, will portray Jane Jacobs. Jane was an urbanologist and author of books of the economy of cities. Her writings have introduced a large audience to the debates on these academic fields. Karen Davis, a student at North Idaho College studying English, she will portray Joan Robinson, born October 31st, 1903 in Camberley, Surrey, to an upper class family. Received her education at St. Pius Girls School and went to the University of Cambridge with second class honors. She retired from Cambridge profes professorship September 30, 1971 and passed away August 5, 1983. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Mr. Adam Smith. Thank you. Uh, I am Adam Smith, and I'd like to give you a brief overview of ideas that even though I wrote them over 200 years ago, shape the lives of each and every one of you every day. Uh, when I wrote The Theory of Moral Sentiments and The Wealth of Nations in the mid-1700s in Scotland, uh, merchants were really looked down on. Uh, the majority of people then were farmers, and they were legally obligated to the landowners for many years. The landowners held all of the wealth, and not only that, they were the only voting citizens as well. Uh, the result was the use of power to keep wages very low. Uh, the only way to encourage people to uh, distribute the wealth to contain their greed was by moral imperative, more or less to say, you should be good because it's the right thing to do. It wasn't a terribly effective way of equalizing wealth. Uh, in designing a more equitable society, my approach was to appeal to the individual's self-interest rather than relying on either a moral imperative or a political decree. Um, my target was universal opulence. And what I meant by that was wealth that was available to everyone, even the lowest laborer. I argued that if market forces were freed of government intervention, then the, uh, an invisible hand would guide self-interest for the benefit of all. My system built on the efficiencies of the division of labor. Say, an iron worker, a specialist who makes horseshoes all day long, 
gets much more efficient at it than a generalist who is also farming, doing leather work, and so on. Uh, as they get more efficient, they can produce more and in turn create greater wealth for society. So in this way, a specialist's uh, greater productivity benefits not only him, which is the reason he is working so hard, but uh, he unwittingly benefits society as well. Taking advantage of the efficiency of this system, um, or taking advantage of the efficiency of the division of labor, is a system that relies on a combination of the free market economy I just laid out, uh, self-control, social control through institutions designed for that purpose, and limited government intervention. I'd like to briefly comment on the last three of these. I t my system takes advantage of the fact that man inherently admires the wealthy and the ease with which we admire or we imagine they live. Since we also desire to in be admired by others, prosperity becomes a powerful motivator. It's important to note that the admiration I'm t talking about is admiration that is earned for acts that are conscience, or what I term the impartial spectator, or the man in the breast, would approve of. This intrinsic drive provides the self-control my system requires. The institutions for social control include not only schools, churches, and the family, but the market itself as well. Capitalism emphasizes work and the ongoing um, motivation of competition. The effect of those two forces is self-disciplining. Those that work survive, those that do not perish. This is the reason for limited government intervention. The market will seek its own equilibrium. It's not a perfect system, but I believe that government intervention would introduce even more inequities. Thus, through the combination of self-control of the impartial spectator, an economic system that appeals to the self-interest of the individuals in society, and a market free of government intervention, we can achieve a society that is created we can create a society that is wealthy enough to facilitate benevolence and that acts morally. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Alice Rivlin. I am presently the Vice Chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. I have served as President Clinton's Director of the White House Office of Management and Budget. I have served as a Director of the Congressional Budget Office. I have served as an Assistant Secretary at the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. I describe myself as a fanatical, card-carrying, middle-of-the-rotor economist. Economic. E economist. <laughs> I urge citizens to think about what kind of economy they want and what should their elected leaders do. My work within the government has structured and contributed to my philosophy, which I have described in my most recent book, Reviving the American Dream. You can purchase this at the bookstore. <laughs> Americans ought to want three things from their economy. An average standard of living that is rising. A rough measure of this rising uh, standard of living would be a per capita national income that is rising. And we're talking about real income, not just through price increases. Inflation is the great deceiver of rising income.
As you can see from this overhead, inflation's peeping through the window. Are you back or are you just a blimp in the numbers? The Board of Governors believes the numbers are real now and therefore they just raised the uh, interest rate, the federal funds rate, by a quarter of an inch, quarter of an inch, quarter of a percent. And this is the uh, interest rate the banks charge uh, each other overnight loans. We have been in a steady recovery for six years. When there's excess demand for products, a record high credit card debt, a shortage of resources, shortage of skilled labor, when the factory capacity is above 85%, when the national unemployment rate is low, below 6%, which is considered full employment, then we start seeing pressure on prices to rise. The Federal Reserve must step in before inflation fully appears. We slow down the economy by raising that interest rate. So we see the bull market, the Dow, on a tight rope, and the slippery banana is the interest rate. Sometimes just the suggestion that the interest rate may be changed in the future is sufficient to slow down the market. Other times, the Federal Reserve must actually change the interest rate. Alan Greenspan, Alan Greenspan, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, uh, has roped the bull, the market, by raising the interest rate. When the bull says, I was, when I was just beginning to feel irrationally exuberant. The second thing Americans should want from their economy is that the improved level of living should be shared by all groups. And the third is that the rising standard should be sustainable over time. To accomplish these three things in our economy, we need to restructure the responsibilities and divide the jobs to be done between the federal and state governments. The states should take charge of public investment needed to increase productivity and raising incomes, education, skill training, and rebuilding the infrastructure. The federal government should eliminate most of its programs in education housing, highways, social services, economic development, and job training. States should strengthen their revenue system by cooperating in collecting common taxes to be shared among them on a formula based on population. Eliminate the different sales taxes. One example would be a value-added tax collected as the good is produced rather than at the retail level. Another would be a uniform corporate income tax, a common state energy tax, reducing pollution and promoting conservation. The federal government should adopt a plan that will ensure basic health insurance coverage for everyone and control the increase in health costs. The federal government should run a surplus in its whole budget, including, including Social Security, thus reducing interest, interest costs and adding to the pool of savings available to finance private investment. These proposals fit together. State responsibility for the productivity agenda would sharpen the distinction between federal and state tasks, making it easier for citizens to understand what each level of government does 
and to blame the right set of officials for poor performance. To revive the American dream, citizens must find new energy and commitment to revitalize the institutions that influence American lives, families, businesses, schools, unions, churches, clubs, and governments at all levels. They must be willing to experiment, change, restructure, and try new approaches to old and new problems. The current confusion of responsibilities is undermining confidence in government and blocking policies needed to sustain a healthy economy. Sorting out the roles more clearly could break the log jam, help both levels function more efficiently and effectively, and improve both domestic and foreign policy. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Betty Friedan, and you may be surprised, as I am, frankly, to find myself on this panel with all these noted uh, economic gurus, both uh, living and deceased. If you know my name at all, it's probably because of a book of mine that was published in 1963. Although it wasn't really my intent at the time, this book started a revolution of sorts. The book, which was entitled The Feminine Mystique, is largely credited with having begun the women's movement of the later 20th century. I know that the book changed my life and changed the lives of women all over this country. When I wrote the book, I was living the life every woman of my era was supposed to want to live. I was a full-time wife and mother with a nice home in the suburbs, a husband who commuted to the city every day for work, and three healthy, active children. I had given up my career as a journalist, well, gave it up after I was fired for becoming pregnant for the second time. This was common practice in the 50s, you have to understand. It was done all the time. It actually took me six years to write the book, as I struggled to find the time to write between the Little League games, the PTA meetings, and all the other obligations of motherhood. I wrote at my kitchen table because the desk, which I had optimistically purchased for myself, was continually covered with the children's projects. I was inspired to write this book by my own feelings of discontent. Although at the time, the women's magazines, most of which were then edited by men, incidentally, published story after story about the fulfillment women found devoting themselves solely to family, for me at least, it didn't seem to be enough. I undertook a survey of my former classmates and other female graduates of Smith College in Massachusetts to find out if my unhappiness was unique. What I found both gratified and saddened me. I found that not only were most of these women, did most of these women feel unfulfilled, some were actually deeply depressed. Like me, most of them had given up careers to marry and stay at home with children. And while they loved their families, they guiltily confessed to wanting more. We wanted an identity separate from our families. And we wanted an opportunity to use our talents and education to make our contributions to society and to be paid for those contributions on an equal basis with men. It served the economy well in the post-World War II days to keep women at home. There had been plenty of jobs for women during the war when men were unavailable to fill them. When the war ended, however, most women, not all, but most women were dismissed without notice or compensation. Even women who had joined the labor unions found that their complaints fell on deaf ears and there was no help to be found there. There wasn't a word for sex discrimination then. It was simply common practice. We also became, served the economy by becoming the prime consumers of the products of the post-war uh, manufacturing cycle. Household conveniences that again the media convinced us were necessary to provide the proper care for our families uh, abounded in the ads and the, and, and the stores. New household conveniences uh, and more gadgets and ever more powerful detergents. Women became 
primary uh, advertising targets and consumers in those years. When I finally finished my book, in which I sort of debunked the myth that women could find total fulfillment in the, in the wife and motherhood role, it was very difficult to find a publisher. Only really sick women, they told me, would relate to what I had written. When the book was finally published, however, it sold over six million copies in three years. I was invited all over the country to lecture and advocate for my ideas. And as I did this, I realized that what women really needed, what we really needed, was an organization to promote our interests and advocate for, for our rights. In 1966, I met with three other women in a hotel room in Washington, D.C., and on the back of a napkin, we wrote out what, has, what was then soon became the major purpose statement of the National Organization for Women, and that was as follows. To take action to bring women into full participation in the mainstream of American society now, exercising all the privileges and responsibilities thereof in a true equal partnership with men. Later that same year, the National Organization for Women, commonly known as NOW, was officially launched. I became the first president and ran the organization from its corporate headquarters, which also happened to be my small New York City apartment. One of the first goals of now was to enforce the enactment of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which outlawed discrimination in employment on the basis of race or gender. We wanted a society that offered equal opportunity for all its citizens, whether they chose professional careers, domestic careers, or both. On August 26, 1970, the 50th anniversary of women gaining the right to vote, I led 50,000 women down Fifth Avenue in New York City in a women's strike for equality march. We were a very strong organization then. Later that year, I resigned as president of NOW, partly to allow time for more teaching and writing but partly because I found myself increasingly at odds with some of the new and more strident voices in the women's movement. They were the female chauvinists who threatened to make a mockery of mother, make a mockery of the movement with their bra burning and their anti-male rhetoric. I knew if the movement was seen as anti-motherhood and anti-male, it would surely fail. In the column that I wrote for McCall's Magazine for many years, I continued to expand on my view of feminism as a woman's right to move in society with all the privileges and opportunities that are their human and American right. Or, as I've heard others put it more simply, feminism is the curious notion that women are people too. As I've continued through my life to talk and write about human rights and women's rights, I've been frequently asked for my current views on the women's movement and on the, our current economic conditions. In 1995, prior to leaving for the World Conference on Women in China, I was asked to share, again asked to share my views in an article for Newsweek magazine. If you will indulge me, I'd like to read you part of what I wrote at that time. Now, in 1995, ideas about the equality of women with men, about our right to participate in society, to earn fair pay, to control our bodies, and to speak in our own voice in political discussion, are taken mostly for granted by the women in the United States. Meanwhile, a growing resentment against women threatens our economic and political empowerment in ways that sexual politics can't solve. The problems in our fast-changing world require a new paradigm of social policy, transcending all identity politics, women, blacks, gays, the disabled. Pursuing the separate interests of women is inadequate and is even divisionary. Our job now is to move beyond polarization to a new vision of community that can unite us as a decent people. I'm reminded of an expression common in, in China, which is women hold up half the sky. And I think we also need to be reminded that we can hold up no more than our half. We need to work together to solve the problems in the new economy. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Bill Gates, CEO of Microsoft. It's certainly exciting to visit the Popcorn Forum here at North Idaho College in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. 
I uh, did have a little bit of a problem landing a 757 jet on your airstrip out here. We ended up going back to Spokane and, uh, um, you know, good transportation to get over here. But thank you anyway. Uh, I'm really, really impressed with the caliber of guest speakers that have uh, attended your popcorn forum. You, you folks have to be awfully lucky and uh, what a pleasure. Uh, uh, colleges and universities are a great place to have open dialogue, intellectual dialogue, places to research, places to explore. And I hope that you students, while you're here, take advantage of this while you can. I certainly look back on my days back in Harvard University, back in the uh, early 1970s, where so many concepts could be explored, researched, discussion being taken place. It was wonderful. On Tuesday of this week, I was, a guest, I was a guest speaker at the Windows Hardware Engineering Conference called WinHack uh, 97 down in San Francisco. Over the years, WinHack has been the place where many of the great advances in PC technology has been introduced. And I'm continually just amazed how thousands of different companies have worked together to build the PC platform. Today, I would like to share a few of my viewpoints on how technology has, computed, or has contributed to a better form of life within our modern world. Over the past several years, I've heard several highly successful entrepreneurs in the technology industry predict that the personal computer is a dinosaur and on its way to extinction. I don't believe that for a minute. When you look at the incredible number of companies that were represented at the WinHack conference, companies who make chips, companies who make peripherals, companies who make software. I mean, it's amazed. This is not a dead industry. The PC is not going to go away. Sure, I think that we can all predict that it's going to get smaller, it's going to change its shape, it's going to get much, much more powerful. But when we look at the industry, it's not going to go away. And so I really disagree with the uh, predictions that, uh, that it is going to die. Let's look a little bit backward in time as to my uh, uh, background. As teenagers back at the Lake High, uh, Lakeside uh, Private School in Seattle, Paul Allen and I shared many dreams of programming and building computers. Those dreams certainly did not stop when we went to Harvard in 1973. My degree goal then, and I know that the panel will be greatly surprised at this, my degree goal was to major in business and economics. Uh, and I can well assure you that even though that I left in my junior year and didn't complete that degree, I've learned more about economics running a company like Microsoft than what you could ever imagine. And so those early day uh, concepts were very, very appreciated. I left Harvard in 1975 to pursue a goal of building Microsoft into a workable company. If producing software had not been successful, I was simply would have returned to Harvard to, compete, com to complete that degree. It was not Paul Allen and I's goal to become rich. Our idea and our concept, we were so excited about a technology called computers and software that that's all that we basically wanted to do. Uh, to, to have a thought in the back of our mind that someday we would own a company like Microsoft no, that just wasn't in the back of our minds. One day, when walking through Harvard Square, we saw the popular electronics magazine with the picture of the MITS Altar computer on the front page. Paul bought that magazine and he cried, this is it, here's our future. He, but he also said, darn it, what really is going on here is that we missed it. We wanted to build that computer, you and I built, but we missed it. And we said, no, nah, what we're going to do, well, let's build the software that makes it go. And so that's what we did. We immediately set out to, to write that software for that little computer. Nobody else had written any software. It didn't run. It was, it was built, couldn't do anything. Didn't even have a, a language translator. So we wrote the MITS company a letter immediately and we told them that we had an answer to their solution. We could build a version of the basic programming language for that computer. And they wrote us back and said, sure, why don't you come down and talk to us about it? So Paul and I feverishly 
wrote all night long code pr producing this language translator, put Paul on the airplane, and then he flew to Albuquerque. Uh, and after the first try, it didn't work. And he said, no, there's something really wrong. Made a couple of slight changes, put it back on the machine, and now we can show the MITS folks, hey, we've got a computer that works. And they were pretty excited. So suddenly, we found out that Microsoft had just been created and born. Uh, down through the years, the PC uh, explosion evolution slowly was occurring. Um, major companies such as Intel, Radio Shack, and even IBM took notice of our success in writing program language compilers and interpreters. And at that point in time, we also wrote other different kinds of application software. In the summer of 1980, IBM invited us to join the team that was developing the IBM PC. And it was their intentions that somewhere in 1981, they would announce and market that little personal computer. We were able to make several suggestions that contributed to, to its success, such as why not put a colored graphics card on the machine. IBM really didn't want to do that. They said, we don't think that's necessary. We talked them into it. And it was a real good thing, because we're really convinced that that colored graphics card has shaped as to how personal computers work today. We also talked to men that let's make the operating system a standard feature that could be installed on different kinds of computers. And that has worked very, very well. It's that standardization that opens up the door for an economic flow of, of uh, competition within companies. And that is good for you and I, because now you and I can buy computers at a very, very cheap price. The IBM PC, as everybody knows, quickly, quickly became a tremendous catalyst that launched the PC-compatible line of computers. And that standardization has re resulted in everybody being able to own one of those things. Consequently, the philosophy and mission at Microsoft today is to continually to advance and improve s software technology and to make it easier, more cost effective, and more enjoyable for people to use. Computer companies that have tried to lock in their product have either failed or in the process of failing today. So now, what's going to be the future going to be like? <clears throat> Excuse me. The internet has surpassed anybody's and everybody's fullest expectations for success. And that includes Microsoft. Several years ago, when the internet came out, we talked about it in many, many staff meetings and said, oh, this is going to be kind of a passing fancy. Uh, maybe down the road, it could take some importance. And its explosion has simply boggled everybody's mind. It has been fabulous. However, nobody can question its power and its role in shaping the way that we communicate with one another. But I'm here to tell you, the internet, the internet in its present form is not the next wave. Surprising, huh? What's going to be the next wave is interactive networks producing a whole line of communication through the, what is called the information highway. The information highway isn't here yet. It's right at the tip of our fingers. And in the, in the, uh, uh, the upcoming years, it's going to be here. The information highway will be able to use a full line of voice, video, and data, and it will become the ways and the means by which everybody on this planet is going to communicate and re interact with one another. As the telegraph, has superseded, was superseded by the telephone, the internet will be replaced by the information highway. But communicating through the information highway must not be expensive for the you, the user. It must be made available to everyone at a price so cheap that everyone will want to use it. The first personal computers were not inexpensive, rather pricey. Very few people could buy them. But as the price came tumbling down and their use went skyrocketing up, people are now buying them by the thousands each year. The price must still get cheaper. Now, everybody's been reading and hearing about the digital TVs. Well, that's going to be true. But personal computers are going to be able to, and it's necessary, to drive this kind of technology. 
We had major, major discussions at WinHEC uh, as of yesterday. And as, and as audio and video devices are converted into digital, it allows the personal computer to stay in. It becomes the driving force. The PC industry already has in place a common standard. And this standard will have direct effects on all of the consumer electronic devices that are built in the, in the future. <clears throat> What's another prediction that I could make to you? Another futuristic technology is biotechnology in the field of medicine. It's amazing to see how researchers and universities and startup companies around the world are using their knowledge in cell biology and the human genome to create new important drugs. Health is something that is important to all of us. And I believe that we will make great progress in curing many of the major diseases over the next couple of decades because of biotechnology. The PC and the internet are significantly already aiding gene research. The recent d discovery of a gene defect that can lead to the early onset of Alzheimer's disease took eight months of painstaking research. Without the internet and the personal computer, the discovery might well still be years away. Researchers plowed through 650,000 base pairs of totally random genetic information soup. I say soup, that's kind of so to speak looking for something that looked like a gene. After a unique gene was found, researchers went out to the internet to look for a match and eventually placed their gene with one that was thought to be Alzheimer's. A cure or even a drug is still a little ways off, but doctors now better understand the root of this crippling disease. Today, somewhere, a young medical student or researcher is surfing the net and experiencing a similar realization about its full potential as a tool for ending suffering. I truly believe that 20 years down the road, he or she will be using a combination of information technology and biotechnology to bring about a change in the human condition that will make anything we have done to date seem very, very small by comparison. Thank you very much. When I arrived in your beautiful city by the lake on Sunday evening, the first thing I did was leave my room at the resort and walk downtown. Um, I had dinner at one of your street side restaurants on Sherman Avenue, and the first thing I noticed was that your sidewalks were almost totally vacant. And one of my theories is that you can immediately tell the economic health of a city by the amount of activity on your sidewalks. They should never be empty. There should be activity at all times of the day and night. But there's got to be something to draw people to the city. Diversification is a must. You don't have to have all new buildings. You can refurbish some of the old ones. You need retail shops. A city needs offices and maybe even some light manufacturing. You need some neighborhood grocery stores, housing, both single family dwellings as well as apartment houses, condos. You need a place for entertainment like theaters, maybe a library and restaurants. There must be everything to keep people in the city there must be mixed use in your urban fabric. You can't just departmentalize. Diversity and activity are crucial to a city's survival economically. And if you have busy streets and you have busy sidewalks and parks, they're also safe because they're always inhabited. You have to have foot traffic for economic growth. When sidewalks become idle, and there are only certain times of, a, of the day that they're used, people lose interest and begin to drift away. Now, I need to stop because I forgot to introduce myself. 
I'm Jane Jacobs. I'm an urbanologist, and I'm an economist. I moved to Toronto, Canada in 1968 from New York City, where I'd worked for about 30 years. I attended Columbia University, and I began a freelance writing career while working as a stenographer in New York. I also have been on the staff of the Architectural Forum as an associate editor. I'm known as a woman with strong ideas who's not afraid to share them. And although I have no professional training as a city planner, and I've never worked as a city planner anywhere, my work is well respected and my ideas by both practicing planners as well as students in the area of city planning. On May 27, 1944, I married Robert Hyde Jacobs, Jr., who is an architect. And he taught me much about architecture and exchanged with me so many ideas about um, building and city planning. I've written several books, and I took a walk over to your library today on the campus, and I found three of them that I'd like to share with you. I wrote The Cities and the Wealth of Nations. I wrote The Economy of Cities. And I wrote The Life and Death of Great American Cities. I also have written many journal articles. Um, one of them, which I really like, and which you could tell by my opening statement, downtown is for people. A nation's economic health is based on the economic health of their cities, not vice versa. Many times we think we have healthy cities because of our nation, but we have a healthy nation because of our cities. A nation's um, economic health, then, is so important. I would like to challenge all of you to take a walk through a city. It doesn't matter whether it's a large city or a small city. You need to observe the smells the noises, the activities of its residents. And then imagine a city without people. Would the city still have the same smells and sounds and hubbub of vibrant human interaction? I don't think so. The city would be dead. So in order to create healthy communities, communities that are economically, socially, politically, and environmentally vibrant, as planners, and as people, as inhabitants, we must design and build with people and all of their various activities, values, and influences in mind. We need to diversify our cities. We need to bring them back into a community in a downtown area. Um, there will be a conference in Toronto that I'm helping to host um, in October of this year. I will be 81 years old next month, and I'm still very active in city planning. I'm going to put on the overhead an announcement of my conference so that any of you that would be interested in attending or might know of somebody in your city that would be interested in attending, you can see when it's going to be. We have keynote speakers from all over Canada as well as the United States. Um, I'm going to be hosting a seminar each day where we will sit down and talk about what we've learned. And I think that it will be um, important to participate, especially I can kind of tell that maybe um, in the Pacific Northwest that some of your downtown areas probably are ready to be refurbished. I want to thank Paul and all the members of the Convocation Series for inviting me to attend your uh, conference and also to be a part of this panel. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Joan Robinson, and I'm a British economist. I am most famous for my book, The Economic Economy of an Imperfect Society. Um, I only have a meager seven minutes in which to 
convey to you who I am, and since my biography contains no less than 24 publications, I will avoid any prolonged and detailed explanations of my economic theories. Instead, I prefer to impart the methods behind my madness. I have a burning love for the pursuit of knowledge and truth. Asia, especially India and China, are uh, being my favorite conduct continent for sojourns because I love to travel. Um, however, despite my love for Asia, students in North and South America, Australia, Africa, and Europe all know me firsthand. When I traveled, I was never restricted to university life. Instead, I would rather go out into the communities and know about the local customs and conditions of life there. Despite the fact that I was rarely in Cambridge during the summer vacation terms and uh, my sabbatical years, I was always very punctual and punctilious back to my classes. I never missed an opportunity for discussion and conver confrontation because it was through these encounters that I refined my ideas. I have long believed that symposiums such as this Popcorn Forum are where knowledge and truth are truly discovered. I took part in many of these forums um, in Cambridge. They became known as the Cambridge Circus. My contemporaries in these discussions included Piero Safra, Nicholas Caldor, and most importantly, Richard Kahn, my dearest friend and intellectual opponent. I am truly indebted to all of my contemporaries, especially to Mr. Kahn, who read, critiqued, and improved every one of my written works. Without their ideas and oppositions, I would not have been able to achieve the greatness that I did. It was my discussions with them that led me to center my attention on the problem of capital accumulation as the basic process in the development of a capitalistic society, which is discussed thoroughly in my book, The Accumulation of Capital, which I will urge you all to read. One of the greatest points of this book is that I liberated myself from symmetry that a mathematically formulated model normally would impose upon economy. My entire analysis is carried out without the use of mathematics. However, again, that can be discovered in the book. Besides ideas on capital and economic security, I also pursued and wrote on topics which included international trade, Marxian economy, and theories of economic development planning. I also had a strong social conscience and became, and because of this, I published several books. I was concerned with the traditional economic text and teaching styles that they were teaching in the schools, and therefore I authored and co-authored several texts of rather an unorthodox nature. I was a rather unorthodox person, which is very well documented as well. I urge you to read about it. It's very exciting, but we don't have time to go into it here today. And I must mention that there are very few students who did not enjoy my classes at Cambridge and um, my abroad lectures. Um, I was also concerned with uh, wider issues of economics. Um, I wanted to give society an overall conception of the world, um, a whole philosophy of life. I wanted people to understand that there was a universal approach to economic reality and it was a viable option even in the face of traditional education. These, among other ideas and subsequent writings from these thought processes, established me firmly as an influential thinker of our century and the only definitive woman among the great economists, which I personally am very proud of. Um, again, I would like to urge you to read all of my works. There are over 24 of them. Um, they're all of literary interest and written in such a way that so that they are delightful reading and of interest to the general reader, especially my later works, The Economic Philosophy and Freedom and Necessity. Your knowledge and enlightenment in these kinds of areas is your key to your future, your good life, and economic security. Thank you, good day, and blessed be. At this time, Dr. Williams will address the panel. <laughs> Thank you very much. Where else could I be in the company of Betty Friedan, Joan Robinson, Bill Gates, and other distinguished colleagues? It is indeed a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I, like Joan Robinson, am somewhat unorthodox. I have actually taken the reality, and I was ex explaining this to a young man out in the hallway, of being a person who is virtually unemployable who has been able to make a career and a good life. In my own personal search for economic security, I have dealt with some interesting 
uh, aspects of my life and to be perfectly frank with you that nothing that has ever happened to me has been bad. Now, when I was laying in the mud in Vietnam, cutting a deal with the big guy as to whether or not I would live, perhaps I might have changed my position. But even then, because before that, my one dream in life was to be a big time corporate lawyer, screw people and make money. <laughs> and I promised myself that if I ever got out of that deal, uh, I would be a better person and I think I am. I have not had a bad day since that day. I've had some trying days, but I've never had a bad day. The reason why I was so pleased at the opportunity to come here and chat and learn from distinguished colleagues here as well as doing the whole aspect of the symposium because I find that in my business, uh, I, I mentioned this morning that I'm not an economist, I'm not a historian, uh, I'm not an academician, but in fact I do all of them. I have an undergraduate degree in government, I have an undergraduate minor in economics, and I have a law degree. And I, I was trying to wait the war out didn't last. <laughs> I still got drafted. And what I do is work. Basically, my career is based on work. I work as a senior administrator of a 70,000 student, 20,000 employee state university system in Iowa. University of Iowa, Iowa State, University of Northern Iowa, Iowa School for the Blind, Iowa School for the Deaf. That's my day job. I work 60% of the time there. The remaining 40%, I work as a management consultant with my wife, who was a plaintiff's lawyer and sued employers, including me one time. <laughs> and what we service are industries, healthcare, high tech, utilities. Uh, we even did uh, George Lucas. We, I actually did the job, I did the compensation for the Wookiee in uh, Star Wars. We did the compensation program for Lucas Films uh, about eight years ago. So I'm a vagabond, literally an economic vagabond. You know, I put this suit on three days a week and then I hang and chill two other days a week. <laughs> I travel all over the country. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to talk about some of the things that we talked about today. And it's my belief that we're at a place that we need to stop and pay attention. I often say to young people, if you want to protect your career, you better pay attention to your career. I don't tell young people about jobs. I don't even believe in the concept of jobs. I believe that in the millennia, the issue will not be whether you have a good job. The issue is whether or not there's work available. There will be work available. There is work available. This young man here stopped me in the hallway and caused me to be late, too. <laughs> he said to me, you know, uh, in all the courses I've been in, nobody's talked to me about how to run a business how to own a business. It was about how to get a job, how to prepare myself to get a job. I was laughing. I said, well, you're talking to the wrong guy here. I don't believe in him either. And let me tell you this, until I was 35 years old and I had been successful enough to be hired in, in senior management, I was never a good employee. And I always felt straight. Why can't I be? A, I could always get the job. I could always get the promotion. And sooner or later, I would piss off my CEO. I'd make him mad. I'd start talking about, can we do flex time? Can we do part-time work? Can we do uh, cafeteria plans for the benefits? So, wait a minute. We, 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 didn't, we didn't hire you for this. And I would say, but this is what we ought to be doing. This is, this is what I want to do. And eventually, through some we would always have, it's time for me to move on because we have philosophical differences. What that meant is, I wasn't running with the big dogs, I was a flea. I was causing an itch, a scratch. 
So I became a consultant in 1987. The same guys that fired me, I charged them three times more and they hired me. <laughs> Let me make a suggestion to you, and we talked about it today. It is my belief, and I'd like to offer this up for your consideration, particularly uh, you young people. And by the way, I define young as anybody breathing. Okay? <laughs> so let's be real clear. I'm, I'm getting to be 50, so it's a little young. It's looking real good to me. I was mentioning today that I am part of a movement that I didn't know I was a part of. And I called them uh, what do I call them? What is it? Oh, cyber guilds. And, and, and let me tell you what I mean. Uh, I work in a cyber cottage, and I'll give you an example, and I want you to think about that as you, as you go through. Oh, about 18, no, 19, 18, 1985, I started to work with about seven or eight incredible people, and we had something in common. We were all pretty smart, but we all couldn't seem to hold a job. We were all eccentric. We all had these ideas, and nobody seemed to want to. They liked our ideas, but they didn't like us. <laughs> they didn't want us around too long. Uh, I have a, a Hispanic fellow in Santa Rosa, uh, California. I have a, a Southern Belle in Virginia who happens to be gay and is real good looking. It really screws up blue collar guys. It really causes a problem. <laughs> okay. I have a friend who is uh, in Leicester, England. And what happens is, we, any one of us, uh, becomes a project manager. Somebody will call me and say, I want you to do this work. In most cases, this work is much larger than I'm able to do. So I will pick up the phone and I will call my seven or eight colleagues. And we will split up the work. I will become the project manager and I get 10 to 15% more than all the headaches. But any one of them may be a project manager. We go into these large companies. These companies that literally, I was telling the story, I, I did a presentation for a well-known West Coast public utilities company. And I have the distinction of being thrown, I was on the 45th floor. And I uh, posited my perspective. They managed to get me down from the 45th floor to the lobby in 45 seconds. That's a record. They threw me out. They, they, they didn't want any part of me. Just last week, I got a call from a senior vice president saying would I be interested in flying out to San Francisco to talk. I told him I wasn't interested. I'm going to make them pay. <laughs> I'll, I'll call them in three weeks, and I'll charge them four times more. I'm going to punish them. No, I won't. I'll charge them fair, fair enough. The point I'm getting at is these individuals that I work with, we will go in, we will scope out a project, we will divide it up, we will work with that client. We don't come in as gurus. We, in most cases, we find the client knows the answer. The client knows the answer. We just help the client to come to that conclusion. Our theory is we are not umbilical cords. We will help you do without us. If we do a good enough job, you will fire us because you'll tell your friends about us. Now, we are, we are info crafts persons in a cyber guild in our individual cyber cottages. We use email, we use fax, we use time. When I get up in the morning in Des Moines, Iowa at 6.30, I got an hour and a half of work I can do in New York. When I get home in Des Moines, Iowa at 5.30, I got two and a half hours I can do in California. And in the two and a half hours I do in California, I'm always doing with a bud. They don't see me. <laughs> Except we're going to put a televideo in my home office next week. And we're going to install it. And I'm going to have to stay a little bit off the screen as I do the bud. We're going to whiteboard. I'm going to sit at a computer. And I'm going to do contracts and so forth and so on with the client. I'm going to do this next week. Now, why is this important? It isn't. But I would like to suggest to you, even those of you who are seeking jobs, and there's nothing wrong with that, I would like to suggest that you think of yourself as your own 
individual corporation. You are the board of directors, you are the shareholders, you are the employees, and what you need to do as you bring what you have to offer to the mix, you offer value, you offer service, you offer quality. If you do that, whether they call it a downsize, or upsize, or capsize, or resize, doesn't mean a thing to you. Because you're bringing to the table what they will pay for. They won't stop to ask you if you're African American, if you're disabled, if you're over 60, if you're Hispanic, if you're gay, if you have a, what do you call it, an immigration card? What do you bring to the table? And if you can bring it to the table, I assure you, you will be invited for dinner. Matter of fact, there'll be a drink at seven. So if, if there's any message I have to you, is this. In, this. in this country, as we're looking for economic security, and we're looking for somebody to do something, you don't have to look anywhere, you, it's in the chair. It's not gonna be government, and I tell people, I am the government, you work for me. I was, had to remind some city official about the government, I said, excuse me, Ace, I pay your salary. Let's get that right, you know? And I'm about to fire you. Uh, at, at a minimum, I'm putting you on probation. You are the government. You are the federal government. You are the state government. You are the local government. It's going to happen if you want to make it happen. There's no such thing as poor, lazy people. As I said today, if the top four-fifth of us are so busy getting ours that we don't take care of the bottom one-fifth, it's going to pull us all down. I don't want to spend $40,000 to send somebody to jail so they can be a better criminal. I'll spend $18,000 to send them to Princeton so they can make sure I have Social Security when I retire. That's what I'm for. Yes, I am. And you should be, too. I don't want to preach to you. I want to talk with you. And I want to say to you, this is a wonderful, wonderful forum in which ideas can be exchanged when people, even when they have reasonable differences, can discuss it. For me, the millennia is not frightening. It is wide open. And as I said today, I'm ready to boogie. I hope you are. Thank you so much. Excuse me, if there any, do we have a question and answer here? Yeah. Okay, I'll sit down. <laughs> At this time, the audience has a chance to address their questions to the panel members. P please stand up and address your, your question to the individual. Thanks. <laughs> Help me, please. More problems here. I perfectly agree with your last statement where you say that instead of uh, spending $40,000 per person to put someone in jail and teach them to be a better criminal, we need to teach them to uh, be a better part of society. What kind of programs do you suggest that we implement to teach people how to be a better citizen instead of leaving them where they are and just trying to take the poverty away from them? Because as, as I've learned by watching it, uh, you cannot take poverty away from someone unless you take it out of their mind first. Well, your point is well taken, and, and one of the themes today was about the family. And the thing that I found most interesting, I too happen to be one of those people who grew up, I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, and I was fortunate enough to be in a, in a situation, which I'll give you an example. I had a situation where I smoked a cigarette at 15. Seven chastisements later <laughs> from seven members in my neighborhood, and the eighth was my dad because I had embarrassed the family. My English teacher told me, you think just because you had 15 points last night in the basketball game and Jack and Swift finally gave you a date that you're hot stuff. You can't come in here thinking you can make a C. You better make an A or better. What I'm suggesting to you is the extended family and it's not sanguinal. I'm suggesting we talk about values and all this and all that. But when you're hungry, 
And when you have no hope, it's damn difficult to talk about values. When people know that you are, it's not values we need to talk about. To me, it's who's valued. When you know you are valued, when, when your community expects you to do as well as you can, everybody can't own a company, everybody can't make an A, everybody can't be a millionaire, but everybody can be a good citizen. Everybody can be. And you don't come here knowing it. It's like civilization. I'm constantly reminding folk, if left to our own devices, I'm not so sure we'd be very civilized. <laughs> we have to work at it. And people have to work with us. Teach us the way. You, you hear a lot today about critical thinking. If you look at the American educational system, it doesn't teach you to think critically. It teaches you to pass tests. That's critical thinking. I better critically think this A. And I'm suggesting to you, critical thinking means we can disagree. Phil Sherman proved something, and, 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 and the South has never forgiven it. There's more than one way to get into Atlanta. And that's what I'm suggesting here. There's more than one way to get into Atlanta. I don't know if I answered your question, but my thought is that how we've been doing it hasn't been done quite so well, but it was nobody's fault. We don't need to point fingers. That's, let's forget about that. I think there's a groundswell, and I'm, I'm across the country a lot, and I'm starting to see it in places. I, I was in Pine Bluff, Arkansas the other day, and why not Pine Bluff, Arkansas? And I had a conversation with some people who just, it would beat any conversation I would have had on 55th in Lexington in New York, and it was about what we need to be doing as a community and as a country. I think, I'm glad you asked that question, because there's two ways to approach that. If you really want change, shut, shut the place down, and the people will revolt. If you really want to speed up affirmative action, try to legislate it out. They won't play. Let me make a suggestion to you, and, I, and this is what got me thrown out of place in, in utility. I had a situation in which 25 senior managers wanted to hire me to develop a management training course for its 5,000 middle managers. Over 85% of them were white males between the ages of 25 and 44. And here's what the senior manager said to me. You know, most of our middle managers are racist and sexist and we really need to do something to correct that. So we want you to come in, and we literally want you, and this is what they told me, pretend you're unzipping their skulls, and we want you to pour knowledge into their heads. So I asked the question of the 25 senior managers, how many of you have uh, golden parachutes? Everybody raised their hand. I said, how, what, how long is most of your parachutes? They said, three years. I said, now, is there anybody in this room making under $100,000? They said, no. So I said, let me get this right. You want a six foot four black guy to stand in front of 5,000 mad white guys and tell them they're racist and sexist and we're gonna replace their jobs with incompetent, undeserving women and minorities. Is that right? <laughs> That's why they threw me out. <laughs> Cause yeah, that is exactly what they wanted me to do. Now, what I'm suggesting to you is I have a theory, and I'm not so sure it's a theory that's, that's, that's held by many, but here's what I have observed. There's a small majority of males in power, in most cases white males, about 10%. They, they own the jobs, the power, the money. They're, the remaining 90% are people by uh, minorities, women, and white males with no power. So you have these three groups fighting over the lousy, uh, this small amount fighting over most of the jobs and the money, when you ought to be cutting into the other group. 
So it's easy for me to tell you what you ought to be doing if I have a safe job. If I went to Harvard and I networked, and I'm not saying that's always the case, it is my belief that if you vote out affirmative action, that's not going to stop what needs to be done because it's going to be replaced by this thing they're calling diversity. And diversity I like much better than affirmative action because diversity says there are white males who are being discriminated against. There are disabled being discriminated against. There are people over 60 being discriminated against. There are people with different views who are being discriminated against. Now, how are we going to deal with our overall search for the good life <laughs> when we're busy pointing fingers about who's discriminating against whom? We're not, we're not helping our country in the global marketplace. So I'm not real upset about 209 because I think there's a point in time, and it, it's always impressed me about America, we said, that's it, that's enough, we're done. This dog won't hunt, okay? So they can legislate all they want. That's how this country got started. Guy said, we want tax. They said, not likely, buddy. We don't think so. So why is 209 gonna be any different? It, it's been interesting to me at every threshold of this country's existence, when we went too far overboard, right or left, right thinking people said, that's it. That's enough. And I'm thinking we are not going to go into this millennia. We cannot survive, in my opinion, when we are constantly trying to. I was uh, I was in uh, California the other day, and I went to my first gated uh, community, and I didn't know who was the prisoner. The people who live there or the people they try to keep out. It was frightening. 209 is not going to change that. Michael Jordan are coming by the whole community anyway. <laughs> Dennis Rodman. <laughs> I don't know if I answered your question, sir, but I hope I did. Uh, does it, I guess my question is, does it change? If, 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 let me, let me make a suggestion to you. The marketplace is not able to allow <laughs> incompetent people, regardless of gender or race, in. And what you're going to find is, there are a significant number of people of color and women who are very well qualified for jobs. And what you're going to find is there are a lot of people of color and who are women who are not qualified just like there are males, white men. And I, I do not think that, it, I, my only problem with this is that there are some kids, let me give you a class. Uh, a significant number of the affirmative action efforts did not help poor kids of color primarily middle class, black kids, and women who benefited. Not very many grassroots kids from Harlem or East LA went on to go to USC. And I will tell you, when we hire, we don't care who you are. If you can bring the bacon, unless bacon is a bad place here. <laughs> in, in Iowa, in Iowa, they're fighting work, they're fighting work. <laughs> I should have said hog. But anyway, uh, I think that's going to be funny because a lot of people are going to find, I'll give you a legacy, there are more people who have been allowed to go into colleges due to legacy. In other words, my parents went to Stanford. Regardless of my grade point, I get to Stanford. There are more people who have been allowed to American colleges and legacy than have ever been in them under affirmative action. That is a fact. And see, when we start talking meritocracy, it gets dangerous because you have to bring it. You can't get in. If you went, really went on meritocracy, I'm not sure we would have had very many of our American presidents if we went on meritocracy. Half of them couldn't have gotten to college. I don't know if I answered it, I'm trying. <laughs> well, that would... So did I. That would conclude our program today, and I would like to thank...
our panel for a great job today. Thanks. Thank you.